Welcome uh, to the IISS uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I'm the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the Institute and the head of its South Asia program. The IISS has been delighted to host from South Asia presidents, prime ministers, foreign defense and interior ministers, national security advisors, and military and intelligence chiefs. And today, for the first time, the IISS is privileged to host a non-government corporate leader from South Asia, Mr. Sadruddin Hashwani. As you all know, Mr. Hashwani is one of Pakistan's most prominent businessmen, being the founder and chairman of the Hashu Group, a leading Pakistani business conglomerate that runs the country's largest hotel operations and has interests stretching from hospitality to oil and gas exploration and production, property development and real estate, industries and commodities trading. Recently, Mr. Hashwani published his memoirs, Truth Always Prevails. What struck me most when I read this book was Mr. Hashwani's personal courage and conviction in overcoming the many unique adversities and challenges he has faced in becoming a leading businessman in Pakistan. This book is also a reflection, I believe, on the economics and politics of Pakistan for the past 50 odd years. Today, Mr. Hashwani will provide us influential perspectives on his life, his business, his country, and the wider regional neighborhood. To start us off, I am delighted to welcome Christina Lamb, one of Britain's leading foreign correspondents, currently the chief foreign affairs correspondent of the Sunday Times. Christina has extensive experience and expertise on Pakistan and Afghanistan and is a best-selling author, most recently, of I Am Malala, co-authored with Malala Yusuf, the Nobel Laureate, in 2013. And, of course, uh, the, the most recent publication of Christina's Farewell Kabul, From Afghanistan to a More Dangerous World, published last year. Christina has kindly agreed to begin a conversation with Mr. Hashwani on his life and on Pakistan. And this will be followed by an opportunity to ask a few questions by our guests. We will then end this session with tea and coffee and biscuits served in the adjacent room through the sliding doors. Let us begin with this discussion session. Christina. Thanks, Rahul. Well, it's a great honor, actually, to be here today speaking to an old friend and person that I admire greatly from a country that I consider my second home, really. And thank you for coming on a very hot Pakistani-like day. <laughs> it's like Karachi today. Um, and on an Eid holiday as well. And um, I was thinking before I came here about um, when I first met Mr. Hashwani. And don't take this the wrong way, but I can honestly say that I've spent more time in his bedrooms mm -hmm. than anyone other than mm -hmm. my husband, <laughs> because he's a hotelier. <laughs> and, um, and as many of you know, um, I'm a foreign correspondent, as Rahul um, said. And as foreign correspondents, we really rely on hotels to be our home and our office abroad. And I think we're probably horrible guests because we don't really go there to sightsee or enjoy. We go there to work. We're always on deadline. We need endless supplies of coffee. We need the Wi-Fi to work. We need things immediately. And if we don't get them, we get really cross. <laughs> so, and every country has its kind of iconic journalist's hotel. Um, it was the Hotel Florida in Madrid during the Spanish Civil War. Um, the Caravelle in Saigon during Vietnam, Europa in Belfast, the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo. And in Pakistan, it was the Marriott Islamabad, which is one of Sajuddin Hishwani's hotels. And it was a hotel that when I went to live in Pakistan in 1988, I first knew as the Holiday Inn, a beautiful white building overlooking the Margala Hills. And then it was the only luxury hotel in Islamabad. Um, Pakistan was the first place that I lived as a foreign correspondent. And in those days, the Holiday Inn was the source of so many stories in Pakistan. Um, if you went to the Nadia coffee shop and sat there, 
you could be guaranteed to meet all sorts of people. You could meet Mujahideen leaders, you could meet the Saudi intelligence chief. I think you could meet the Texan congressman, Charlie Wilson, sometimes with his beauty queen um, girlfriends. Um, sitting in the same place as sort of fundamentalist leaders like Gulbuddin Hekmatia. It was fascinating. Um, and I spent a lot of time there. And it was really um, a place that you could just guarantee that you get a story if you sat there. Now, of course, after 9 11, um, this hotel suddenly became world famous and everybody stayed there. You had Christian Amanpour of CNN and John Simpson of the BBC broadcasting from on top of the roof. And I think I'm correct in saying that it was so popular that even had to set up beds in the ballroom <laughs> for journalists. So when the hotel was bombed in 2008, I couldn't believe it. I'd actually been staying there just before. I was booked to stay the following week. So I thought, let's start the conversation with you talking about that terrible day in 2008 um, and how you got the news about the hotel being bombed and what you felt about it. Well, that's a very interesting question. The hotel which I built from brick to brick and had a motion with this building. And that particular day, that was my grandson's birthday. So I was at my daughter's house. And then I decided to go to for prayers. Normally, I go to the hotel. So when this blast happened, my son, Murtaza, sitting here, he immediately rushed to the hotel. And he was stopped by a policeman without he realizing that I'm in a prayers hall, Jamaat Khana. So he was sent away. By the time I heard the blast, I reached the hotel site. The man who stopped Murtaza going into the hotel, he was also one of the victims died. The, it's a very painful story to see my 54, 58 people dying. They were my people. You know, somebody took away their life. It was terrible, you know. That was more pain than the building pain. Because what I can rebuild, but I can't bring those people back. But anyway, that very moment, I took over the charge of taking the I think the if you speak part. more towards yes. the audience, because they may not hear. So I took the dead bodies out of the rooms, got people who were injured into the hospital. 75 people were admitted in a private hospital, where, which we paid. There was no help from the government. And we were managing the dead bodies, the injured bodies, and relief operation was conducted by ourselves. This was terrible for a reason that it was not the building, it was human life. And who do you think was behind that attack? Well, if you see that day, it was Antafa Ramadan. There was a dinner arranged by the Prime Minister then. So everybody was at the Prime Minister house during the same time. It was red alert. Security was so tight that even the car would not allow to go without going through proper check. And then this truck full of all the explosive was allowed to go and go in the front of the Marriott Hotel and waiting for the time. And it happened with the finances of the government. Otherwise, this could have never happened. The truck would have never been allowed to go to the hotel when it was red zone. So the government knew exactly. And that particular day, after the blast happened, we were in tears. And there were some people with celebration. So I can't say more than that. You can understand what I'm trying to reach. That's a very strong allegation. And why would the government want to blow up the most iconic hotel in Pakistan? You see, there are the enmities in the world. People have been assassinated. Head of the state have been killed. You can't stop the enmity. Enmity is there. Jealousy is there. So I don't say that I don't have enemies. Enmity, it is there. But that particular day, in the red zone, 
if car is not allowed, the truck was allowed. It was parked at Margala Road. For hours, truck which exploded. And then, well, I can't say more than what I've said it. I've said everything. And yet, the then President Zadari said he was supposed to be the target because he it was said all he was lies, supposed you know, to be all in, lies, in the you know. hotel. People said that he was having a, a third dinner, 200 people. You know hotel very well. Ten people come, there is no table. How can I accommodate 200 people? There was no booking. There was no reservation. It was all false, negative propaganda. The President was supposed to be there. If he were there, this thing would have not happened. And you promised to rebuild that hotel within 90 days. And at the time, I thought you were crazy because there was this massive crater. You couldn't imagine. That, that day, that some people said, Mr. Sadruddin today has gone. He's finished, number one. And he has gone mad when I said, I'll build it 90 days. In 89 days, I opened the hotel. I became myself the main contractor, then hired the subcontractors. In the month of Ramadan, everybody was, you know, on a holidays or everybody was traveling. But it was all miracle in my life that I built it in 89 days. The entire hotel, because I became myself the main contractor, buying expensive things at a ridiculous prices, because price was not the consideration. It was the reputation of the country to fight the terrorist. I know the terrorists, but I can't say it. But it was Allah's mercy, God mercy, that hotel was built in 89 days. I opened it, called the American ambassador and some of the diplomat. They came and they celebrated, fine, you know, it opened. It opened even a better hotel because I rebuilt the entire hotel. But it was one of the miracles of my life. I've seen many miracles, but this was, this was God mercy. And in your book here, I mean, I knew you with already having built up your hotel empire, but not until I read this book did I have any inkling of you know how hard it had been to do that. And you've made some reference there about the difficulties you're working in a country where a government doesn't want business necessarily to flourish and there's a lot of jealousy. It's very difficult to make your way in public. Difficult for honest people, not for everybody. The favourites get overnight favour. But the people who are honest, transparent, they go through hard way. As you say in your book, to be a businessman in Pakistan is to negotiate a minefield. Corruption and nepotism are second nature to our politicians. Well, you see, the country has suffered because of this failed democracy, this particular democracy which we have, constitution, with amendment one after another, is failed. And uh, it's only when you have a deep pockets to fight the election. You win, otherwise you lose. I don't think any man without money can win an election in Pakistan. So this is not a democracy. This is Westminster democracy, which is not functional in Pakistan. There are four provinces, 200 million people. One man cannot travel 1,000 miles for his own relief work. So that basically the politics has become of money. You spend money, get elected, and make 1,000 times more. And your book, apart from telling your own struggles to build up your business, I mean, is very much a sort of political history of Pakistan because you were born 1940, 1940. in Karachi, so seven years before the independence of Pakistan, yeah. and then lived through three wars with India. Um, why do you think, and then of course seeing Pakistan more recently on the front line with terrorism, why do you think Pakistan has had so many problems? Is it a failure of leadership? You've I think it's all, all leadership, this. all leadership. Either you talk about individual business, you ask about country, cities, it has to be leadership. If you have a good leader, things will happen. Otherwise, nothing happen. The above all is the law, justice. It's very difficult to get justice in Pakistan today. Unfortunately, and big people have been both in position as my judge or your judge. And judiciary is today, they find qualified people. But unfortunately, the qualified people are sitting outside. And the favorites are inside. So if you can't get the justice, that's the end of the story. 
And as Rahul said at the beginning, you're the first businessman to speak here. It would be interesting for people, I think, if you talked a little bit about just how difficult it is to um, work in Pakistan to try and run a business. I mean, there's some incredible stories in this book of different things that have happened to you, of being arrested and put in solitary confinement. Can you tell us a little bit about You see, basically, happened? what happened, unfortunately, that I'm not a politician, not that I'm in politics, not that I intend to be in politics, number one. Number second, my principle is not to bribe anybody. Fight on principle. The highest number of cases I've gone to the court to fight for my rights. I've been getting rights, but it takes very long. And that's basically the disadvantage for many honest entrepreneur Pakistanis who have migrated outside Pakistan, America, London, Britain, whatever you call it, you know, they are all successful because they got out of, out of chains to be freedom, <coughs> to do business. Business is basically a freedom business. But unfortunately, and this constitution, electing prime minister or parliament, is a total failure. And we have to go for some new constitution, new leadership to deliver. Deliver is the answer for any question, for any problem. And I've been fighting all my life. What kind of system would that be? What do you think Pakistan should be doing? What you have in this country. Merits prevails, not favorites. Did Unfortunately, you? favorites, people who are involved in uh, shaking hand or greasing somebody's palm, they are successful. But long stories in Pakistan. It's a beautiful country, full of resources, but the honest people have not come forward because they can't compromise. And people who compromise, they are sitting there, no accountability, nobody has gone to jail even. So I think half of the businessmen, half of the politicians should have been in jail. Not sitting in the powerful seats. Yes, you, I can write ten books on the corruption of the people. Politician. I should have warned you at the beginning, he's quite outspoken. Beg your pardon? <laughs> I said you're quite outspoken. <laughs> no, but I'm telling you the fact. And yeah. I wish somebody can, you know, debate on this point, which I've said it. And I have hundred examples where the favoritism and bribery has overtaken the law. What do you think about the current government? You went back to, you were in exile, weren't you, for five years? I was in exile because exile, I was only one reason. I know who did the bombing of Marriott. I knew who made a time on my life. Now, you know, I'm not a government, neither I have got a police force, you know, to protect me. If I know my enemy is there looking around for me, I cannot be that stupid and foolish to <coughs> present myself before the bullet. So I sent my children away to the way. They got admission, all the children were there, and one son is already in London. So for six years, I myself and my family remained out of Pakistan. Because you know, there was no justice, there was no law, there was no protection, you had to hire your own guards. What a country, you know. And what a democracy. This is the democracy. When the father of the nation is running the country, father of the nation has to look after every single child and not to kill every single child. I'm sorry, being very open. And how have you found it going back? What's the situation now? No, it's better, you know, at least Nawaz Sharif is a very gentleman, but the system is there. And totally bureaucratic system. Judiciary is very weak, which has been created over the years, you know. Like Musharraf, you know, he put entire Supreme Court in jail because he could not get what he wanted. That's not the country. Allah is my friend, Musharraf. But wrong is wrong. It's my country. These people have migrated. This is my seventh generation in Pakistan. My father built a house in 1938, which opening ceremony was done by late Aga Khan Sultan Mamin Shah. He was one of the creators of Pakistan. And he fought for the right of the Muslims in United India. In United India. Well, you just referred to the Aga Khan, you are an Ismaili, part of the Shia community. We have seen numerous attacks on Shias in Pakistan over the last couple of years. 
Why is that happening? It is basically, you know, the foreign powers, I don't know, in creating a rift. There was no rift. Islam is only one. We are all born from one soul, Hazrat Adam al Islam. There's no rift. There's one book, Holy Quran, last prophet, be peace upon him. There's no rift, but rift is created by spending money, building madrasas, creating hatred. Which foreign powers are you referring to? Which the, foreign powers? Which country? Yeah. You know very well. You know. <laughs> Everybody knows. <laughs> Audience might like to know. <laughs> um, and you recently, I saw, described the current army chief of Pakistan, General Rahil Sharif, as the last hope for Pakistan. Isn't one of the problems in Pakistan that the army has too much power? They are not exercising the power. If they love the country, if for that they have taken an uh, oath on Pakistan, they should then, when they conduct the martial law, they should know exactly where are the criminals. And they are in jail, they are being fed, and they are committing crimes from jail. They should be eliminated. Where is the human right for them or for the people who have died? Everybody talks about human right. What human right are you talking about? When the criminals are sitting, enjoying their life, creating, committing crime from jails, they have got gangs, kidnapping is the biggest business, not in Pakistan but Afghanistan. Now it's not reported, but many people are being kidnapped uh, from Afghanistan into Afghanistan. And the current Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is due to replace the army chief, I believe, in November. Do you think that General Rahil should be kept on? I personally think he has done a superb job. He has put Balochistan in place. He has done a lot of good things in terms of there's no crime. Transparent man and come from a blue blood family. Rahil is a very, very good general after a long time. After General Asya Nawaz, when he was of the same nature and same uh, character, and see the same quality in this particular general. Any human being is different. And do you feel safe in Pakistan today? Absolutely. This is my country. I love this country. Fine, I have to take a little bit of precaution. And I give my children also the private guards to follow because of kidnapping, nothing mm -hmm. else. You know. Killing is easy. Kidnapping is something which is very difficult to tackle. And how do you feel? I mean, as you know, I've worked with Malala. Yes. And um, one of the things I find very sad is that a lot of people in Pakistan, it, rather than embracing and being proud of people who have done good work, like Malala, or in your case, um, your business and the foundation that you run, those people, rather than being embraced, are often forced out of the country as you were for a while. I went for only one reason. I knew who was my killer and he was in power. I had to keep my children out because that, the biggest pain is when, unfortunately, God forbid if you lose your child. So I thought better keep them out. The way was the best place, easy to travel, communicate. And I remained out also almost the same time because of this only one reason. I knew who is my killer waiting for me to open my chest, which I will not do it. Okay. And um, just before we open up to the audience, I wanted to ask you, I understand you're still building new hotels yes, in Pakistan yes, despite hotels, everything. Hotels. So how do you feel about the economic situation in Pakistan? It's a very today? rich country. Very, very rich country. Recently, they found one biggest treasure, which is called Rikode Mine worth $22 trillion today worth. I got a phone call from someone. He said that it's a license in a, for the biggest reserves of Pakistan, copper and gold. I said, fine, send it to me. Since I'm in oil and gas business, I had my geologist. So I told them, I said, find out what it is. And uh, they came back to me. He said, this is something which they had never seen. It is a very large, large deposit. And that deposit continued from Pakistan, Afghanistan, 
to write into Central Asian countries, same build. So I said, I don't want it. So the people who had the license, they said that, why, what is wrong? I said, first, why you want to do? He said, you are a Baloch, we need support. I said, I said, what is the second thing? He said, you know the business, you can help us. And you keep 25%, we get 75%. I said, but this is the robbery. What the Balustan government get? Nothing. Before there was one mine which was given to Chinese, they took away even not the reserves, but even the sand. And the government of Pakistan got only $75 million with billions of dollars worth of assets. Pakistan today is the richest country in terms of the minerals, gold, uranium. You name a thing, Pakistan doesn't have it. But our leaders never focused on exploring something which convert into money. They spend money on the education, building a school, hospital. So government is interested basically looking after their own pocket or giving this the, the opportunity to their favorites. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ashwani. I <clears throat> the, the floor is open uh, for, for questions. Uh, let me begin by asking uh, the first question, and uh, that actually follows uh, very well from uh, Mr. Ashwani's uh, last uh, few uh, sentences uh, on, the, uh, on the economic, uh, the international collaborative nature of, of economics. Uh, uh, sir, a new narrative has emerged uh, within Pakistan of the China-Pakistan economic corridor being a prospective game changer for Pakistan economically, politically, and in terms of uh, security. What is the perspective of Pakistan business towards partnership with Chinese business and prospects of implementation of the China-Pakistan economic corridor? Basically, <clears throat> the distance at the moment for Chinese to, to carry their uh, shipment wherever they are, it, it okay, takes about almost 1,100 to 1,200 kilometers. This particular corridor will reduce to 700 kilometers. If you just look in front and speak. Yes. Mm -hmm. the, the distance between the transportation will reduce by three-fourths. It will be very economical for transporting wherever they want to transport. China will benefit the most as far as Pakistan is concerned. Definitely, it will be an opportunity for Pakistan to save money on the transportation. Pakistan is a huge country with huge resources. And I think this economical corridor will benefit to everybody, including Central Asian countries. This is going to link to the Central Asian countries as well. OK, and let me open it uh, so I can see uh, okay, uh, Viraj uh, Solanki first, and then I'll take the rest. Yes, please. If you could identify yourself. Hi, thank, uh, Vera Zelenki, S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hashwani, for a very good talk. Um, Pakistan has a very young population at the moment, with roughly 60% of the population under 25 years old. <laughs> How do you think the youth can be utilized by the Pakistan government and corporate Pakistan uh, to meet the prescribed 7 to 8% economic growth rate? And how can the Hashu Foundation also <coughs> help in reaching this target, especially through empowering women through the honeybee farming project that you currently run? You see, the Hashu Foundation was a dream of my late mother. She was doing a lot of charity, and so was my growing grandfathers were doing charities. And charity is part of called Hukuk Adibad is this part of the faith of Islam. You do charity. So Hashu Foundation is trying its best, you know, to to enlarge the activities for education, for self employment. Honey bee project was something, you know, where they were producing honey and they were paid nothing, the growers, particularly in Chitral. So we undertook, my daughter and my son both got involved, and we started buying honey from these small farmers, process, 
and give them the, all the profit. So from small number of honeybee, today there are thousands of women who have started the same, you know, growing honeybees, and uh, they are benefiting. They are sending their children to school before they could not afford. And there are some children can also go now to the universities because of their own income. It's a very small project to name, but it's a large benefit to the large community and large number of families. Uh, yes, the gentleman who has the microphone, if you yes. could please identify yourself first. Yes, my name is Mehrab Sarju. I'm assistant to His Highness Khan of Kalat uh, from Baluchistan. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, sun, uh, Rekodek and Sandak. People of Balochistan don't benefit from those resources. And the resources is in Balochistan not belong to Pakistan. Those resources belong to Balochistan according to the 1948 stand steel agreement between Khan of Kalat and Pakistan. Balochistan is occupied land. Uh, you said Pakistan need a new system and new constitu uh, constitution. Do you not think that Pakistan is a failed state? Is a time for it to uh, call it off? It is beyond the reform. Thank you. What is your name? Sorry. Pakistan. No. What is your name? Sorry. My name Mehrab Sarjui. Mehrab, so you are a Baloch? Baloch, yes. Okay. Um, Shall, I Shall I talk to you in Baluchi? Shall I talk to you in Baluchi? Because yeah, people right. will not understand, you know. No, I'm also Baluch, you know. I know Baluch more than you know it. It is Baluchis who have failed their own Baluchistan. They have compromised, they sold themselves. The leaders, Sardar. What do they think Sardar are what? Keep people in prison? Slaves? Why they don't educate their own people? They pocket the money all themselves. Okay, that, that's it, that's it, that's it. That, that, we can have the discussion after the formal Listen, session. Listen, I know Balochistan more than you know it. You don't. Okay, that's it. Uh, let's go to the next uh, question. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Victoria Schofield. First is education. Without education, it's a darkness. Walking in a dark corridor. Pakistan, the government has not built any college, schools, or universities, unfortunately. It is government failure, success is government failure, to spend money on arms, on our luxuries, on this parliament. The amount of money which goes after parliament, what they to deliver, fill their own pockets. This, as I mentioned earlier, this is the failed democracy. We had to have a democracy, transparency, and when the, the, the democracy is to help your own constitution. The constitution is suffering, as I told my friend, that the Sardars, they have not looked after their own people, tribe. Illiteracy. Why illiteracy? Very, very rich province. Half of the Pakistan is Balochistan. 75% of the resources are in Pakistan. The three gases in Pakistan, but Sui gas people do not get gas in Sui. The gas reached Peshawar, but not Sui. Now, this has been injustice done by the federal government. And then, again, the voice of the Sardar is a very strong voice. If they join hand together, if they join hand together, they will get, but Sardar has to get, get together. Because I know all the Sardars, they are my brothers, but they must get together and fight for their resources, invest money in the education. Why our people are going abroad and finding a job? There are so many jobs that we will be looking forward to have people in Pakistan to come and serve in Pakistan. So much rich country, but yet our people are leaving the country. And uh, for only one reason, there's no jobs, no investment, no industrialization, as I mentioned to you. It's a job of the government to industrialize the country and use the resources 
for the benefit of the people of Pakistan. Uh, next, uh, Lord Nazir Ahmed. Nazir Ahmed, uh, I uh, was at the... Um, well, thank you very much anyway uh, for your wonderful uh, uh, insight into what's happening in Pakistan. Uh, I was at Marriott uh, on the day when you reopened it and I really have to say uh, a big congratulations uh, it, that you managed it within 90 days uh, to reopen Marriott. Um, you talked about corruption and um, uh, other people have raised uh, corruption. W what is your opinion of National Accountability Bureau and where NAB and whether uh, pre-bargaining is working? Um, I know you've tried to avoid this question, uh, the man who might be behind uh, the attack. Um, what, are, what, what, what is your opinion in terms of three political parties in Pakistan? Uh, because uh, Imran Khan is not doing as well as uh, what he was doing before. Uh, if uh, Nawaz Sharif fails, then people are talking about uh, probably uh, Pakistan People's Party and Mr. Zardari going back in Pakistan. How uh, would you assess uh, then Pakistan's uh, position uh, then? I see. Good question. The Nawaz Sharif is doing very well at this moment. But he has inherited so much inefficient people, corrupt people, and he has no choice to sack everybody. So he has to carry on with him all this garbage which he has been given to him. He is a good human being, patriotic Pakistani, but at the same time I think, you know, we have given him a sinking ship to sail through, which is very, very difficult, and he has to fix the ship first. No. 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 Yeah, it is basically corruption, nothing else, you know. They sell the agent, sub-agent, pre-bargain, and then cases are closed. How many people never sent to jail? The gentleman there who will be very patient, that, uh, I should, on, they're on the extreme, on the right-hand side, of one, two, three, fourth row on the side. Yes, if you could identify yourself, please. Oh, hi. Um, so Tony Baldry. Um, a number of years ago, I um, took my two children, who were then, I think, aged about 19 and 17, a boy and a girl. We flew up to Gilgit, and then we drove up to Hunza, and then we spent some time crossing the Swap Valley uh, to Peshawar and up to Landikotal, spent time with the Khyber Rifles, then back to Peshawar, stayed with friends, then back to um, Islamabad. And last year, when I was in Islamabad, I said to our High Commissioner, who now seems to live in some sort of um, Barbois fort, um, how much of that journey would he now allow me to do? And he said, well, if you're lucky, he said, I'll allow, I'd allow you the travel advice if you were to come and visit Islamabad. In other words, I couldn't, with the consent of the British High Commission, actually get out of Islamabad. And I just don't see how one can attract foreign investors into a country where they can't travel. So if you can't get foreign investment, people get poorer. And if they get poorer, then terrorism gets enhanced. And I just don't see how Pakistan breaks out of this vicious cycle of lack of security and therefore lack of foreign investment and then greater poverty. I think you have the right question. And I'll answer you on one word, 1977, 78. I wanted to start airline based on Southwest pattern. You know, you just buy a ticket, go inside the plane. I was refused permission by Ziaul Haq. Ziaul Haq never liked my voice, never liked my face, and I got message from him through Noor Lagari, the director of intelligence. Please do not go and socially wish him, Ziaul Haq. I said, tell him go to hell. Finally, I don't know where he is, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, you know, I would have started that airline, which had been 10 times better than PIA. And I do business, not looking into profit and loss, looking at my own commitment to my own country. I owe to that country whatever I am today, alhamdulillah, with Allah's mercies. It's my country. I love my country. I could have left this country many years back, the way I was harassed, the way I was, you know, uh, 
tortured, I would say, you know, but never left a hope. Fought, fought, fought. And I still am there. Many people are run away, they want to come back, but they have lost the opportunity, opportunity of owning to the country. This is my country, I owe to my country, whatever I have with Allah's mercies. So the deregulation is the only answer. Where you go for permission, corruption. Ask for anything, favoritism. So I try to avoid the sector which have restriction, control. Otherwise, they're free. I can build any number of hotels. We are an oil business. We have over 90 wells. We are doing very well, and we will continue to do more, inshallah, with Allah's mercy. But you know, two things commitment with the country and courage to fight. But what about, sorry, I mean, the problem that Tony just referred to, the, the lack of security, how do you attract foreign investment when there isn't security? I don't think there's any security problem as such is concerned. I don't feel any security problem. Fine, kidnapping is a problem, which everywhere, is, even Afghanistan, is suffering from security problems. Kidnapping, kidnapping is a big business. But otherwise, you don't need security. I today walk through mountains. I am not scared of it. Uh, Murtaza Ali Shah. Yeah, uh, Mike, Mike Murtaza. Okay. Uh, Murtaza from Geo News. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, after your book came out, uh, former President Asif Ali Zardari had uh, sent you a defamation notice. So we want to know that uh, what had happened of that, Senator uh, Faratullah Babur had sent that legal notice. Uh, did it go into court or uh, do you think that your allegations were correct and uh, probably that's why Zardari Sahib did not pursue that? Uh, and uh, again, as Lord Sahib said, why is it that you know that who uh, bombed your hotel, but you are not naming that person? What is the reason for that? And the last, the third question is that uh, you have given your opinion about Nawaz Sharif, but what do you think of uh, of the chief, of the four uh, chief ministers of Pakistan? Uh, who do you rate the most? Who, who, in your opinion, is do, doing quite good? At this moment, answering your last question, who is good prime chief minister? I think Nawaz Sharif is doing a fairly very good job, but again, as I mentioned earlier, he has a lot of garbage, you know, which he has carried forward. I don't know how he can frisk it, to be honest. Other thing is, Mr. Zadari legal notice. I got a four-page legal notice, and I only sent one reply to his lawyer. Can you find out from a client he ever had any reputation? This was my reply to him. He spent four pages, and I sent two lines. Please find out from your client. Did he ever had any reputation? Never got a reply again. And uh, as far as the, the problems are concerned, problems are multiple problems. But as I mentioned, this system is not going to solve the problems. The, the gentleman there, yes, yes. If you identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Lakhu Lohana, and I'm from Words in the Congress. Mr. Ashwani, uh, I'm, I was born in the same part of the world where you were born. Couple of questions. Number no, one. No, just two questions, two questions. Yeah, two on. questions. Number one, that uh, the Aisha Siddiqui's book, Military Incorporated, clearly demonstrates that the biggest corporate company in Pakistan is Army, which own from an airline to a bank to a bakery. How that position affect the private entrepreneurs. That's number one. Secondly, this CPAC, China Park Economic Corridor, is one of the most ambitious economic program. And as a businessman, because we believe that Pakistan is not a one nation, it is nations like Sindhis and Balos, they are historical nations. And we believe that it will be converted into satellite of China, how that will affect you said a life in business in today's Pakistan. What will be life in business of tomorrow's Pakistan? Thank you. Number one, as far as Pakistan is concerned, it will benefit from this corridor and all through because it's going to help all the provinces of Pakistan through this corridor, number one. Number second, it is going to help Afghanistan as well, Central Asian countries. This is a development program. Now, your other question was army it is involved in everything where private sector has failed. Country don't want to fail. Army has come forward in creating jobs for the people. They don't hire the retired generals, you know, for their own uh, work. The laborers are all from all over. 
and they are doing fantastic job for the foundation the biggest foundation because you know they are uh, uh, they are uh, investing money but if there's other companies who are want to come forward in the same field there's no block it uh, I, uh, dr william crawley has I'm William Crawley of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Well, thank you for calling me. I actually was going to ask exactly the same question about the power of the 4G Foundation and other army institutions. Does it distort um, a business in Pakistan for people like yourself? But you have answered that question. So I will ask a rather a more simple question. The, the title of your book, which I haven't yet read and look forward to reading, Truth Always Prevails, to a cynical journalist's mind, it looks as if you're having us on, you know? And I, I wonder whether you can say why, such a, uh, why you think such an optimistic title is justified. Can you say in a few I'll words? I'll give you my book, you read the book, and then I'll answer you the question, and you'll get your answer yourself, you know. You can't give me a clue. You must have the courage to fight for the truth. Uh, Dr. Ijaz Hussain. So this is Dr. Ajaz Hussain. Good to see you after 15 years. I mean, I haven't shared your bed with like uh, Christina or uh, Victoria Schofield, but uh, you and I used to do regular exercise in Marriott Gym in 2000, 2001, right. when Samir was the GM over there. Yes. And I was as the young uh, media consultant to General Pervez Musharraf in his first cabinet. Now, my question is very simple, that we have covered all the elements of corruption and internal and external factors towards that. But I would like to draw your attention, is Britain doing enough? If we bring 10,000 pounds into Britain, we are charged with money laundering. But if we bring $10 million, they call it investment. Now in the last eight years, since 2008, I've got the whole listing, 300 plus Pakistani businessmen, dodgy rogue businessmen, politicians and bureaucrats. They have brought like seven billion pounds of investment. The land registry bears testimony to the fact and the other few organizations. So I don't think so Britain is doing enough to stop the inflow of that ill-gotten money. Do you agree with that, sir? 100% basically the country where the money is coming, they must know the source of the money. It's clean money, transparent money or black money. So all this money which is coming here, who's sending the money? Ask source from two people, many who's sending the money and who's receiving the money. You'll get the answer. It's all tainted money. Uh, Baroness Varsi. Um, well, thank you very much for a, a wonderful, thank you very much for a, a wonderful, wonderful talk. And it's, uh, it's uh, good to uh, see you after many, many years. Uh, I think the hot weather is making everybody very angry and negative today. So I want something quite positive to come out of this uh, uh, talk, uh, really. I'm um, a second generation British Pakistani. I was born and raised here. And a phrase that I used when I had the privilege of being the uh, British Minister for Pakistan was that, Ek dil ka hissa hai jo hamesha hamara Pakistan ke saath hai. My children don't feel like that. That's partly probably because of me. and I haven't sold Pakistan to them in the way that my parents sold Pakistan to them. So help me as, uh, as somebody uh, who I respect, how do I sell Pakistan to my children? Send your children to me for one month every year. <laughs> I will look after them. Sir, I have five of them. You may regret that. <laughs> Believe me, send it to the right place. Send them to Pakistan. I don't know how old they are there, but I'll send them. My son is running the hotels, Murtaza. Train them in hotel, how to learn the business, how to deal with the people. And I have told my you know, staff, recruit female staff. They are better than the men. I'm sorry I'm men, but still I'm giving compliment to the women. They, they handle the job very well and better. But you see, you cannot take away your emotion from the country. Pakistan is my emotion. I would have left country many times back. My first the disaster happened with Ziaulak. One day, you know, I met him at General Happy Bula, like, God bless his soul, at his house. It was a dinner in honor of Vice President of Romania. I went there. First time I met him. 
then I have got one bad habit. I penetrate in the eyes. So when we were having a food, I was just looking into the eyes and I saw nothing but blood, you know. I said, my gosh, who's this man? You know, it's the prisoner of Pakistan, martial administrator. That was just after one month he took over and that proved to be right. And I was very critical of him, openly, publicly. I was warned many times, don't criticize him. I said, who the hell is he? He's come from Jalandar. This is my seventh generation in Pakistan. This is my country, not his country. He's a migrant to Pakistan. Anyway, so he knew that, although without any other thing except Allah's support, I was very fighter, openly. And I used to abuse openly. My 22 telephone were on tape. I didn't care a damn. And gave me more opportunity to abuse him. Send him a message, which I used to do it. So basically, you know, Every country has a problem. This country has a big problem. America has got a big problem. They got into war unnecessarily, killed millions of people. Everybody knows today what superpowers are doing it and what sort of a vicious game they are playing it without respecting. Every human being has a soul. Soul belongs to Allah, God, whatever you call it. Parents have only conceived a child, but soul has come from Allah. And soul has to go by. In Allah, in Allah. So, you know, basically, people forget the death. If you remember the death, that you have to live with your death, the one day you have to go and you will be answerable, then things will be much better, easier for the world to live in peace. I have keep Pakistan always in your heart. Send the children. Thank you. I have the last three uh, questions uh, for, for people who want to ask, and then we have to end because the time is running short. But let me start with Ashutosh Shastri first. Ashwani, good afternoon. I have read your book. I really enjoy reading it. Uh, the first part was, I have never been to Balochistan, but the train journey that you described in your book was quite evocative. Uh, Gwadar, Pasni now have become very interesting places in the world. And I am a consultant in the oil and gas business. Uh, and, and I know that you have a tremendous interest and you have a great presence in the oil and gas business. The Saar Energy Center is also based in Pakistan. Uh, I know, you know, we have problems with Balochistan, but I have a forward-looking question, which is, henceforward, how does, in, in your mind, if Balochistan and the people of Balochistan have to have a, enjoy a stake in the prosperity of the country, what sort of a blueprint do you have in mind? Do you have one? What kind of, what would it look like? Respect people, give them what is due to them. Balochistan people are beautiful, nice people, humble people, hospitable people. <coughs> And if, you know, somebody who has killed one of their relatives, if they walk into their house, they will forgive him. You know, this is the tradition of Baloch. So Baloch don't keep the grudge as Pashto keep it. You know, they want to kill the generations. But Baloch don't do that. They're loving pair, caring people. So one has to learn how to respect and how to make a relation with the family. And you are doing any work in Balochistan, we'll be happy to help you without cent interest, no interest, I will help you. Uh, Kiran Hassan. Thank you so much, uh, Hashwani Saab, for a fantastic account on contemporary politics in Pakistan. Your book talks, gives a very strong message about the youth of Pakistan. If you have to give a message in, in one line for the youth of Pakistan, what would it be today? Thank you. Don't forget your roots, roots wherever they are. This is your country and you owe to this country and country also owe to you to make your life. The biggest problem in Pakistan has been the politician, ruler or military ruler, whatever you call it, they ignore one thing which is a basic thing. It's called education, education. I've written in my book, Mr. Bhutto nationalized the education. One of his friends asked Mr. Bhutto Zulfi, you have edu nationalized education? He said, why are you not worried? Your and my children are not going to study in Pakistan. They will study overseas, relax. Now, if that is the thinking of the father of the nation, ignore other children and look after only your few children that they will study in overseas. Now what, this is again I mentioned earlier, leaders, leaders have destroyed Pakistan, nothing wrong with Pakistan, nothing wrong with the people of Pakistan. 
but you love your country, love the people, respect the people, and they are your assets. Nothing else is asset. The last question, Antoine Levesque. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such frank and vivid recollections from your experience. Thank you. My question relates to India. Um, I wonder if, um, very simply, there is a constituency um, in Pakistan amongst businessmen who support closer relations with India. Thank you. Relevant question, but there are only few individuals who have personal relations with the leadership of India to get benefit. I can't get the benefit because, you know, if I apply for the visa, I will not get the visa for India. I'm supposed to be blacklisted by India because I speak the truth. Truth is, again, what is India? You know, they have invaded three wars on Pakistan. They destroyed Pakistan. They broke Pakistan. Bangladesh, half by a false hijacking one plane, Fokker friendship plane coming landing in Lahore. One man came in, blowing up the plane. And then you invade a war in Pakistan. Pakistan is a small country. They have got a lot of responsibility towards their own people. And Pakistan cannot afford the defense what India is spending. Today you go and see the defense budget of India and Pakistan. We are peanuts. But then again, we have to defend ourselves. Now, thank God we have nuclear power. Before, we never had. When three wars were invaded on Pakistan, let them try again now today. First, here in Asia, they will see another one. They invite problem, they will get the results. If India invade again, they will see what happens. There's a gentleman there who I think you mentioned yeah, someone. David wanted. Page. Okay, so yes, please, David Page. Yes. David Page. Last question. Yes. I have read your book and, and found it fascinating, your, your, the way you triumphed over so many obstacles, uh, political and, and others. I just wondered, are there any sort of economic reforms that you would like to see in Pakistan to release the, the potential of, of uh, business? I mean, beyond the general need to clear up corruption and so on, are there any economic reforms you, you'd argue for? And secondly, do you think that you, know, you are a leading businessman who has succeeded? Is the business community acting as a unified lobby to get a better playing field for, for business in Pakistan? And are there things that it could do to, uh, to improve the situation? Well, as far as businessmen is concerned, they can never be united. They can never be united because everybody has got selfish interests. As my friend just asked the question, some people are, have a close trading relation with India. Yes, that is true. But everybody cannot have that relation unless you are a very special man. I don't want to name. Second question is that business community is divided. They look after their own self-interest. Third thing is the, the government has no reason to be in business. The only business is to run the country, provide education, health, social welfare. Now, you know, government during the time of Mr. Bhutto, they started going into every industry. And one day I told General Ziaulak and he got offended. I said that Bhutto has nationalized every industry. The only one industry he has not uh, nationalized is Potato Corporation. So I told him and I could see on his face anger. And next day I got a phone call from Nur Lagari, that message from President, do not shake hand with him socially. I said my message is tell him, go to hell. What can you do to me? But then, I, then, then he got involved into every damn thing. The government has got in business. They should be out of business. They should not have any corporation to do business. Business should be done by businessmen. Now, the, I was the largest exporter of cotton, known as the king of cotton. And I was in Toronto. I got a phone call from a little brother. Little brother, he was with me at that time. That, uh, sorry, we have been uh, nationalized today. I said, don't worry, don't release even one man from the job. I'm coming back and we'll find a way. We do not remove anybody from the job. We kept all the people, although they were only expert in cotton. Then I started textile, building hotels, started exporting other commodities like barley, maize. But I kept myself and my staff busy. 
The rizq is in the hand of Allah. God gives you bread and butter, nothing else, you know. But you have to work for it. If government decided at that time nationalization, so the corruption started from the nationalization at the time by Mr. Bhutto. Mr. Bhutto called all the industrialist businessmen for the New Year party. He said, no, no more nationalization. In the morning, all the banks were nationalized. You know, yeah, you can't have this sort of a leadership. In 12 hours, he break the promise and make people jobless. Banking is the biggest corruption. Thank God they have been prioritized, or they've been giving their back. The banks are doing much better. At that time, you could not get a loan from the bank because the government was against, the door was closed. I am an example before you. But fine then at that time, the Bank of America was not nationalized, it was an American bank. They became my sole banker. And so the bank was only, banker will do business where they make money. And in exporting, financing, there's nothing but profitability. So I agree, you know, that they have been mishandling many things, but government has no business to be in business. Uh, on that uh, note, uh, I think we have to end uh, this uh, session. I think we've heard for the last hour plus uh, uh, some very influential perspectives from uh, one of Pakistan's leading uh, businessmen. And I'd like to thank Mr. Hashwani uh, for being here and sharing uh, his uh, his, his perspectives with us. And I'd also like to uh, thank Christina uh, for uh, uh, carrying this, on this conversation uh, with Mr. Ashwani. Uh, we end now, but there, uh, there, I think there should be some tea, coffee, biscuits just across the sliding door. So please, uh, those of you who can stay, uh, please stay and join us uh, for tea, coffee, biscuits and <coughs> meet Mr. Ashwani uh, at that time as well. But so I want to uh, uh, express my gratitude to you and IISS for providing me this opportunity where I believe there's only head of the states have come before. I'm a minister. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.